Hi, you're listening to The Sociology Show, a podcast about absolutely anything to do with the wonderful world of sociology. Whether you're a teacher, a lecturer, a student, or just taking a passing interest, this podcast will look at a range of issues from social class, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, crime, education, and anything else that sociology has to offer. My name is Matthew Wilkin, and each episode I will speak to someone working in the field of sociology and let them explain all about their own interests, their research, and their experiences. So, put your earphones in, turn the volume up, and let's be sociology geeks together, eh? Hello and welcome to the Sociology Show podcast. The Sociology Show podcast is brought to you in association with Tutor to You Sociology, the exam performance specialist for A-level and GCSE sociology students and teachers. And so you can visit their website, which is at tutortoyou.net forward slash sociology. And there you can pick up revision guides, flashcards, revision videos, and everything else that you need for your A-level or GCSE sociology studies. And so my guest for this episode was Julie Bindle. Now, for those of you that don't know Julie Bindle, I was going to write a little introduction, but having looked at her website, it, she sums it up perfectly. So I'm just going to read verbatim from her website. Julie Bindle is a journalist, a writer, a broadcaster and researcher. She has been active in the global campaign to end violence towards women and children since 1979 and has written extensively on rape, domestic violence, sexually motivated murder, prostitution and trafficking, child sexual exploitation, stalking and the rise of religious fundamental and its harm to women and girls. Julie regularly voices her opinion on TV and radio. In my interview with Julie, I was able to talk about two of her publications. We talked about the pimping of prostitution, abolishing the sex work myth, and we also talked about her upcoming book, which is entitled Feminism for Women, The Real Route to Liberation. Julie's real character and really passionate about what she does and often does things with quite a lot of humour and so on as well. I really enjoyed my interview with Julie and I would like to have talked to her for longer actually. I only had a half hour slot in her busy schedule um, but I really really enjoyed the interview. Maybe if it's popular and there's lots of interest I could get Julie back at some time in the future to talk to her in more detail but in the meantime let's go over to the interview with Julie Bindle. Hi Julie, thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. It's a pleasure. Uh, where are you coming in from, Julie? I'm in North London today. North London. And I appreciate you uh, giving up your time because I know you've got a busy schedule and it's also a glorious day out there. So I, I really do appreciate it. Um, Julie, the first thing I always ask people to do is uh, perhaps if they don't know too much about you, if you could just explain who you are and what you do. I'm a journalist and a lifelong feminist campaigner and the main topics that I campaign around is male violence um, an end to the sex trade. I look at rape and domestic abuse, femicide, which is women being killed by men because they're women. And I'm lucky enough to be able to travel around the world when we're not in COVID um, lockdown to, to do research and to investigate these stories. So I'm very, very privileged. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, we're going to talk about some of your research on that. I was, I was looking at how many countries you studied for, for one of your mo most recent books. So uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you, Julie, is how you define your feminism, because I know that's really important in terms of what, what type or what kind of branch of feminist you are connected to. I'm very glad you asked that. Um, I'm a feminist. And, and that's it. And yes, there are hundreds of ways to be a feminist, but most of them are wrong. Mm. I mean, that's that's clearly a bit of a facetious answer. So anyone who wants to use the label feminist, you know, be my guest, go ahead. But that doesn't mean that they actually fit the description. And it doesn't mean that we can just have a definition of feminism that's so wide that it becomes completely meaningless. For example, Margaret Thatcher, to some, she was a feminist. Beyonce, as brilliant as she is, She's a feminist because she's a strong woman with opinions who's successful. And the reason why I haven't used the term radical feminist for a long time, or at least I try not to, um, if it's not going to kind of muddy the waters, is because I'm really a bit sick of feminism being all things to everyone. And this being the only civil rights movement, liberation movement, that seems not to be allowed 
to define our own movement, our own parameters, our own aims and objectives. Are you aware that it still says radical feminists on your Wikipedia? <laughs> I wondered if you noticed that. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I don't write my Wikipedia. I think that people that write their own Wikipedia, there's something a little bit um, interesting there about them. And I, I haven't looked at my Wikipedia for a long time, but last time I looked, there was quite a lot that was, that was inaccurate. But yeah, of course, I have used the term radical feminist. And the reason why I have in the past is because it became necessary to distinguish it from the liberal feminists, from the, what Andrea Dworkin called the fun kind. In other words, the feminists that will do pretty much everything to appease men, to not make men feel uncomfortable. And I understand this because I also grew up as a girl in patriarchy. I also grew up being told that the most important thing was to be approved of by men, to be... I suppose for men to be attracted to you, for men to be interested in you. And I soon got out of worrying about that. But for many women, that is so important to them. And so the, the radical bit of my feminism is, I suppose, just the real and authentic bit of feminism. In other words, yeah. if men don't feel at least challenged, if not a bit uncomfortable with what we say, needs to change and who's to blame for the state we're in then we're not doing it right and the thing about fun or liberal feminists is that men love this feminism and that's the title of my new book feminism for women the real route to liberation because if men like your feminism if they're clapping along the sidewalk at the slut marches where women are walking bare-breasted with slut in lipstick across their breasts and men think this is fantastic or when women say stripping is empowering sex work is empowering then what does that tell you it means it's benefiting men more than it is those women and, and that brings me on to one of the questions I wanted to ask, actually, because I heard your interview with Andrew Doll, really, really fascinating. And you were talking about whether men can be feminists or should be feminists. And you're very much in the no camp, aren't you? Well, men, of course, can be feminist allies and we really need men to be feminist allies. And I, I really do invite all men listening to this, that consider themselves progressive, consider themselves anti-oppression, consider themselves to be part of a global struggle for the liberation of oppressed people. I invite those men to become feminist allies and they would be so warmly welcomed. Now, the reason why I would say no to men being feminists, and this causes an awful lot of consternation and some hostility because people think that you're saying that men shouldn't have a stake in this or be um, engaged in it is because when men say, for example, the particularly privileged men in university LGBTQQI plus societies, those very, very privileged men that are now inveigling their way into feminist societies in universities, some, some of them are even becoming heads of feminist societies, is that they say men can be feminist too and young women who really do i mean really need feminism right now are just so delighted that these men are saying that other than did you get my dick pic so they'll say yes 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 of course we would love you to be feminist and what then happens is these men want to take over what they're doing is saying we will brand feminism we will define feminism for you and if the oppressor defines a liberation movement guess what happens? Unless they're those exceptional few men that really do give up their privilege and consider their role to be to educate other men about sexual violence, about paying for sex, about objectification of women through, through pornography and advertising, then they do become the colonizers of our own liberation struggle. And women only have one liberation struggle in the world that centers us. That's feminism. We only have one. We don't have any others where women are at the forefront or that speaks about our oppression and our needs first and foremost. So, no, men can't be feminists because they take over and they become leaders and they define it for us. But please, men, please become feminist allies. 
Good message. Good message. Is that kind of the, the focus of your upcoming book then, Julie, about that the feminism should be central to, to women and become a, a, a women's movement as opposed to being open to everyone? Yes, absolutely. My book is looking at where we are now, which is that we have a situation where feminism is really, it, it, it's just become meaningless in terms of its definition that's banded around universities and banded around um, NGOs and social media. And it doesn't speak to women. It speaks to a few elitist some women that really are just perfectly fine to go along without challenging men at all. But mainly, it really, really does benefit men. And the book is, I wrote it for younger women. And of course, you know, I mean, I'm 58. It's a fair question to ask. And I ask myself this all the time. Why should young women listen to you? Well, you know, they don't have to. Uh, I'm hoping that I've provided some ammunition and some tools for young women in this book to be able to answer back to those men in their fem socks, in their LGBTQQI groups that are coming out with all this bullshit about sex work and trans women are women and they can tell you how to be a woman and you're a bigot for daring to protect your rights. So I hope I've given them some tools and ammunition. And when I think back to when I was 17, 18 years old and moved to Leeds in Yorkshire from a town in the northeast of England and met feminists who were about 15 years older than me at the time. They'd all been through university. Some of them were working class, but they'd all had higher education because then, of course, it was way more possible to do that as working class women. They had read theoretical books. They had read feminist theory. They'd been activists for some time. Some of them were lesbians and they were out and proud. And when I met those women, at first, I felt embarrassed that I knew so little, that I was so inarticulate, that I was so badly read, that I was educated, but really, really appreciated being mentored by these women, being showed the ropes, being kind of not protected, but being supported um, and shown the way to find my own feet. And what I would really love is that young women read this book and I've interviewed 50 young women for the book, most of whom couldn't give me their real names because they knew there'd be reprisals from the, the bearded dude bros on the left who think they, how dare they have an actual opinion about feminism, unless it's that stripping is empowering, of course. And I wrote it for those young women because I think that they do. I think young women do need something other than the dribble that's put out by the new intersectionalists, the academics that talk about anything but oppression. They talk about empowerment rather than oppression. They shame women into speaking about being raped. I mean, there's an academic um, text out at the moment that Oxfam uses in its training of how to be a trans ally. And I wrote about it for The Telegraph with Melanie Newman from the Bureau of Investigative Journalists. And we found this text online and it's absolutely appalling. It's saying that if white women report rape and cry their white tears, they are harming people of colour. And this comes from the idea that because, of course, especially in the US, there are black men incarcerated who are then brutalised and raped by other men. And of course, they shouldn't be there because it's a, uh, usually miscarriages of justice because of endemic racism in the US. And certainly we have some of that here. That that means white women somehow shouldn't report rapists in case these black men are brutalised in prison. Well, what we do is we reform the prison system, which is what I've been fighting to do for decades, rather than say to women who are raped. And incidentally, just in case anyone's in any doubt, black women are raped too. Um rather than actually letting these men just get away with it even more than they already do, because we have a brutal, unjust prison uh, system, is that we say, of course, report them to the police and let's make sure that the police do their job properly. And let's make sure that prisons aren't being used as holding pens for black men or other marginalized groups of people when they haven't actually committed a crime serious enough to be incarcerated. Thank you, Julie. And you, you 
started to talk about it there as well, but I know you are concerned with certain factions or branches of feminism. Is it, is it that intersectional feminism? You mentioned the type of feminism that's being talked about in universities. What specifically are the, the branches of feminism that really worry you? Liberal feminism and feminism for men, which is pretty much the same thing. Um, what worries me is the misappropriation and bastardization of the term intersectionality, mm. which, of course, is an a, a extremely useful uh, tool and also, I suppose, spirit level when we look at the way in which the differences between women translate into hugely different experiences um, but that the core experience of being of growing up female in this society is something that also unites women in in a number of ways one is of course male violence the one thing that unites women all over the world is the, the fear and reality of rape of domestic abuse of childhood sexual abuse of fgm of forced marriage all of those things that we know happen because of patriarchy under patriarchy and in order for men to maintain uh, their power and privilege over women and so the kind of feminism that really worries me is the liberalism that's masquerading as feminism but is anything but and it serves to appease men intersectionality um now seems to have been rewritten as something that can be appropriated by a posh white bloke who calls himself non-binary, polyamorous and sapiosexual. I'm sorry, but having a blue fringe does not make you oppressed. We should be looking at structural oppression and not individual identity politics that can be co-opted by the most privileged in society to use against feminists and against women like me. And, and this is where you face quite a lot of criticism, isn't it? I was, uh, in one of your interviews, you were talking about um, reactions to you talking at universities and you've had terms such as turf thrown at you as well. Um, I mean, where do you stand on that, Julie? Because that, that, that must be incredibly frustrating that you're delivering a message which often is just not listened to. Well, you know, I, I don't choose to go around speaking about the trans debate, the war, the... Um, individual identities or rights of trans people, I support the individual and collective rights of all marginalized groups. And of course that includes trans people. But what happens um, in particular universities at events that I've been asked to speak at about male violence, not about the trans issue, is that those anti-feminists that masquerade as progressives see this controversy about my views on transgenderism, transgender ideology, see it as an opportunity to get me deplatformed after I've been invited. So I don't talk about being no platformed. I'm not interested in whether or not certain universities want to ask me to go and speak. I do lots of unpaid work. I don't really need to add any more um, to my schedule. I do plenty of it. This isn't about my career. This isn't about my income. It's about being prevented from speaking to students that invite me to speak about sexual violence and how to counter it, how to end male violence, and how to actually be part of an effective successful women's liberation movement. So of course being told that I'm a bigot and this relayed publicly being called a fascist, a Nazi, is just beyond the pale. It's outrageously inappropriate and it serves to silence younger women, women without a public platform, women without a steady income. Of course, it sends a very clear message to them that if they're not careful and they dare invite me to speak or they dare agree with me or they dare say what they think, if it happens to be quote unquote controversial, that the same or worse will happen to them. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Sorry to move you on to another topic very quickly, but I did also want to talk about another one of your publications, The Pimping of Prostitution. 
Do you want to say a little bit about that? Because it was, it was a large study, wasn't it? 250 interviews across 40 countries. So a, a huge sample we're talking about here. I started researching the pimping of prostitution in absolute earnest at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. Um, and, and I... I, I, I researched it for about two and a half years, doing interviews, flying all over the world, pretty much. I couldn't get to South America, but many other um, regions of, of, of the world. Speaking with pimps, brothel owners, sex buyers, women who'd um, escaped the sex trade, women in the sex trade, those in legal brothels, illegal brothels, on street, off street in New Zealand, where there's supposedly the gold model in dealing with prostitution, which is decriminalize everything and make it like the Wild West and pretend that the problems have gone because you happen to call a brothel owner, um, in other words, a pimp, a manager, and, um, and you sanitize it in that way. And I did this because pretty much everywhere I went in the world, you know, and this has been happening to me since I started actively campaigning against the sex trade um, back in the early 90s, was I would say, well, prostitution is harmful or prostitution is indicative of male supremacy or it's a barrier to equality between men and women. And, and I, would, I would ask feminists, those not involved in any political activism, I would ask conservatives, I would ask liberals, I would ask leftists, what do you think we could do to tackle the harms inherent to the sex trade? And they would say, almost to a person, legalize it, decriminalize it, make it safer for the women. And I thought, well, what evidence do you have about that? I already had the evidence that this had been an you know, just unparalleled disaster. And I document this very thoroughly in the book. And so I was really concerned about how the mythology about the sex trade had spread so far and wide. And it's this, this is, this is the kind of key plank. The myths around prostitution are pretty much summed up um, as such. That if you remove all laws pertaining to the sex trade, including brothel owning, pimping, paying for sex, curb crawling, soliciting the like, that it will solve the problems because the women will no longer be hassled by the police because the police will be taken out of the equation. And of course, it means that the punters, the Johns, will be less nervous, less angry at the idea that they might get caught. So they will be less likely to take out their anger on the women. That the women, because they're no longer stigmatized and seen as criminals, can go to health organizations, can go for STI checks, can go for contraceptives and the like, and there'll be no barrier to that. Well, okay, so if you separate that out, of course, decriminalizing people in prostitution, whether they're men, women, transgender people, children, of course, that's an abhorrence. There is absolutely no way that we can justify criminalizing those that are abused under the system of prostitution. But why do we lump in pimps, brothel owners, sex buyers and other exploiters? Why do we decriminalize them? So, of course, the perfect solution is what was called the Swedish model because it was first implemented in Sweden in 1999, adopted by a number of other countries and is now called the abolitionist model, which is that governments that take on this way of dealing with the problems of prostitution, prioritize the prostituted person, almost always the woman, and throw the kitchen sink at helping her exit the sex trade and get all the support she needs at the same time. But in the meantime, we criminalize the punter because we want to deter future generations of boys and men learning that a woman's body is theirs for the taking, for one-sided sexual pleasure. So it educates the general public, but it also means that there is a threat hanging over the buyer that need not be implemented, it need not be acted upon if he chooses not to pay for sex. Because I've got news for you, listeners, the penis apparently does not drop off <laughs> if the person attached to it doesn't have sex with whom he wants when he wants. It is not a human right 
to pay for sex. But it is a human right for women not to be treated as vessels for one-sided sexual pleasure. So, so my book looks at the arguments for legalization and decriminalization. And I speak to 50 sex trade survivors who say what we need and what should happen. And in short, because it's a long book, it concludes with the notion that we can actually do without prostitution and under patriarchy, prostitution would not thrive. It would be starved of oxygen. And for those that say, but we'll never get rid of prostitution. It's always been here, yada, yada, yada. I say to them, do you say that about child poverty? Mm. Do you say that about child sexual abuse? Do you say that about other social ills? No, of course you don't. We can always imagine a world free of social ills that are humanly constructed and, and made to thrive. So that, that's the pimping of prostitution. And I've just released an audio book, um, which is, it's a lovely addition to the, to the um, printed version because it's read by a great narrator called Eunice Wong in the States. And it's really brought it alive. And because there's so many voices in the book, you know, 250 interviewees, as you said, mm. it, it's, it's a really lovely format for the book. Thank you. Thank you. And going back to, to the uh, Feminism for Women, when is that being released? Is it September, you said? Feminism for Women is out on the 2nd of September. And I'll be having a big launch in central London with a number of speakers that have been interviewed for the book. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And hopefully, if COVID restrictions are lifted properly, I'll be able to go on a big tour. Brilliant. Thank you, Julie. And where else can people find out about you? I know you're, you're active on Twitter. You've got your own website as well. Yes, I have a website. Um, I'm on Twitter. It would be great if I wasn't abused on Twitter, but that's yeah. part of the experience of being on Twitter. So fill your boots. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm a founder of, uh, of Justice for Women and we have a good website. I'm a, um, a trustee of the Emma Humphreys Memorial Prize, if you want to look that up. Um, I'm a board member of Space International, which is a um, sex trade survivor-led abolitionist group uh, of feminist campaigners that are placed around the world and we campaign for uh, an end to the sex trade. Um, and yeah, I'm um, sometimes on your, on your TV and radio and podcast just like this. Right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Julian. I really appreciate you uh, squeezing me in, 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 a, in a very busy schedule. Oh, it's been my absolute pleasure. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much, Julie. Take care. You too. The Sociology Show podcast relies on the kind contributions of sponsorship and donations. If you enjoy the show, then you can help with the hosting costs by donating as little as £5 on the GoFundMe page. Simply visit uk.gofundme.com and search for The Sociology Show. If you can donate, then you will be sent a Sociology Show pen as a small thank you for your continued support of the show. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the podcast. If you would like to contact the show or be interviewed, then please email the Sociology Show Podcast at gmail.com.